morning everyone uh, without wasting any more time the topic given to me today is indeterminate alf so uh, simply speaking indeterminate alf basically means any case of acute liver failure whether it is in children or in adults where you are not able to assign a specific cause so uh, this would be my outline i'll start with the basic incidence what is the prognostic value the relevance of this indeterminate alf what can you do to decrease his incidence and what is the underlying pathophysiology and therapeutics if you are able to ascertain that so how common it is uh, if you look at the literature i'll i'll i have tabulated both our pediatric and adult literature this is from the developed world in uh, children you see that uh, bearing a uh, in the clear high high hdi developed countries the roughly the prevalence of indeterminate alf varies from almost 30 to 50% barring a one study that came from Romania and this is the largest cohort the pals study group from america when they uh, used almost 1150 patients in this their predominant cohort was 43% were indeterminate so overall if you see that even in the developed world almost 50% of the cases can go up to indeterminate if you look at the indian subcontinent this is barring one study which goes up to 50% this was recently published from jipmer pondicherry rest of the studies overall the indeterminate prevalence in indian studies is slightly lower as compared to the western world varies from 9% to 15% this was our paper when we published 6 years back and when we have added more data is almost 422 patients now recently uh, published we almost had still had almost 20% patients who were indeterminate in other developing world is almost same slightly higher 30 to 50% so overall the percentage of indeterminate alf in western world is slightly higher compared to our part uh this is from adults if you see uh, prevalence varies widely from 0.3% to almost 50% but if you look at the indian study the three indian studies if you have quoted they have slightly higher prevalence we would expect these prevalence to be lower compared because these are in indian subcontinent we have lot of infections going on but predominantly if you see from aims 1400 patients almost one third of the patients were still indeterminate and this was a recent study and from the largest alf study group uh, from america almost 1600 patients when they published in 2018 their prevalence is slightly lower if you see it's 11.9% so they are luckier in that sense that they have a lower prevalence of indeterminate alf so why is it important why do we want to learn why uh, indeterminate alf does it have any prognostic relevance so if you see uh, this was the first study that was published on uh, alf study group when they looked at their indeterminate cohort they found that they have worse survival with natal liver and higher lt rates compared to patients who are diagnosed alf so you do not know the diagnosis that is why you are skeptical to give them a proper prognosis you will push them towards transplant and this has happened they have shown clearly that if you have a indeterminate diagnosis your provider will push you towards a liver transplant if you are not improving and also they have shown that in the srtr database almost two third of the pediatric alf who underwent transplant were of indeterminate etiology and this was another paper that came from pal study group they have shown this this was a wonderful study what they did was Uh, they divided these indeterminate cohorts into five groups based on the trajectory using three dynamic parameters uh, it's something at advanced statistical module known as growth mix model gmm model in which they had looked at it's nothing but in a, in a heterogeneous population you are trying to define subgroups which are homogeneous in some sense because they are following a specific trajectories for some variables so they included inr bilirubin and hepatic encephalopathy which we already use in our clinical practice and what they showed is that most of the patients of indeterminate alf were fulfilling this were fitting into this group 4 and group 5 which had which had very poor outcomes almost 60% of this indeterminate alf either died or required liver transplantation and they were going with respect to this group 4 and group 5 you can see the inr is going up bilirubin is going up encephalopathy risk is keeps on increasing for the first 7 days so what they showed is that if you have a indeterminate etiology majority of our your patients would have a bad prognosis and as you can see from this so what how can you decrease the incidence of indeterminate alf 
let me call them false ALFs, false inde inde indeterminate ALF. Why I'm calling them false indeterminate ALFs? Because it is our fault that we didn't put up a good differential diagnosis. We did not do proper diagnostic testing. We missed out on some cases, some tests, and or we did not have time. Patient came, deteriorated very fast, died or underwent liver transplantation. We did not have any time to do proper testing. So let's think of the error causes. I'll come back to this later. So inadequate testing. It has been shown that if you look at this from ALF study group, they have shown that 20% were not tested for hepatitis A, almost 20-30%. 20% were not tested for autoantibodies or autoimmune. Almost majority of them did not have evidence for metabolic screening. And almost one-fourth one of them were not tested for Wilson's. And almost only 5% of these patients were screened for all of them together. So you are missing out on these cases. We are not doing diagnostic testing in almost one-third to one-half, one-third to one-fourth of these patients. So let us go back one by one to all the major etiologies. So if you have viruses, so what they did, this uh, ALF study group in, uh, PAL study group in US, what they did, they looked at their 860 participants, almost half of them were indeterminate. And they did a retrospective testing based on the samples which were there in their biorepository. Bio so they divided it in, into causative and associated viruses. This was uh, not a scientific classification, but they just divided that. So they uh, in, assumed that hepatitis A, B, HSV, Parvo, Adeno, and Enterovirus are the only one which can actually cause, rest can be incidental. So what they could find out of these 820 samples that they tested, almost 20% came out to be positive in retrospect. And this included 12.4% of your indeterminate cases. So that means almost one-sixth of the cases they could assign a diagnosis in their indeterminate ALFs. And important thing here was that HSV also came out positive in patients who were beyond infancy, even in adolescence. So what they concluded is that, and almost 70% were never tested for HSV. So it, they, what they recommended is that it can be a potentially treatable cause in older children, adolescent, as well as in adults. I don't think anyone here as a, in adult hepatology would test for HSV, but I'll show you the later. So even in this case, what they did, this was ALF study group. This was an adult data. So what they did, they had 187 indeterminate patients. Those patients who were negative, viral negative, they did were metagenomics. So they went a step ahead, not just did serology or PCR, they did metagenomic sequencing, and they came out to be eight cases were came out positive on metagenome sequencing, which included four cases of HSV. These are adult patients. One Parvo B90, one each of CMV, HHV7, Hepatitis B, and Parvo B90. So HSV and these cases are not rare. We are not just looking after them. And this, look at the headline. This is Hepatology 2019 paper in adults, ALF study group. Hep HSV simplex associated acute liver failure often goes unrecognized. So what they did, they looked at their, that 1600 patients and they came with retrospect testing. They came out, 20 cases came out to be positive. And what they could differentiate, they said if you have higher, uh, more proportion, they had fever, malaise, rash, and very high AST as compared to other non-viral and viral etiologies. And HHV6, also known, we recently had one case also in our group, and what they had shown, this was a recently published case series of six cases, pediatric HHV6, in which they have shown that when they did a biopsy, HHV6 patient had predominantly zone 3 involvement, like uh, central lobe necrosis and center perivenulitis, uh, with severe inflammation, and if you compare it with other etiologies like paracetamol or ischemic shock, they have necrosis versus minimal inflammation. And but other viruses would have a non-zonal necrosis pattern; they would have multi-lobal necrosis. So what they concluded is that if you have a zone three changes, zone three severe inflammation, zone three necrosis, think of HHV6 as one of the etiologies. Second important group is drug-induced liver injury. Uh, not very common, uh, this paracetamol in India, but let's go back. So what they did, this was uh, ALF PALF study group, 393 patients. So they went back, even though many of these patients did not have history of PCM overdose, they checked for these PCM adults. So what they could find is that almost 11% of those indeterminate ALF came out back positive with uh, for these adults. So that would mean, in retrospect, even though they had not given a clear-cut history of a toxic dose of paracetamol, they still came out to be positive. And what they have shown here is that these APAP cases had higher ACLT, 
sorry, these cases who were edX positive had very high HDLT lower bilirubin were matching the phenotype of paracetamol toxicity. And in these patients in determinate ALF, they had higher spontaneous survival versus those in determinate ALF who were not adducts positive. So they were matching the phenotype. So if you are suspecting uh, based on your very high HDLT and lower bilirubin levels, if you think that it may be paracetamol toxicity, use early NAC if you have a compatible lab picture. But they were not the first one. This study was similarly replicated five years back by ALF study group in which also they could find that almost 18% of their indeterminate ALF came out to be adducts positive even though they have not given a proper history. And similarly, match the phenotype match with the APAP cases and they had higher spontaneous survival. So if you are not using NAC in these cases, you are denying them an opportunity for spontaneous survival. Third important group is autoimmune hepatitis. Are we missing out on autoimmune ALFs? So what they had shown, this was a study in 2017. So what they had shown that when they retrospectively checked these 986 patients, almost 28% had one autoantibody positive. And this auto, out of these two, uh, 202, so autoimmune group, we expect that majority of these cases had autoantibody positive, but almost one-fifth of indeterminate ALFs also came out to be positive for this autoantibody. But, but does, does it mean that they have autoimmune ALF? Not exactly. So what they concluded is that autoantibodies are common, are not definitely associated with 21-day outcomes, but if, if you have this autoantibody positive, you should continue testing for try and go ahead with liver biopsy if you think strongly think of autoimmune hepatitis and does not eliminate the need for a complete diagnostic evaluation. So they may be non-specific, but you have to keep them in mind. Now comes uh, our favorite part, what is the genetics? So we have looked at viruses, we have looked at drugs, we have looked at autoimmune illness. So the fourth important aspect for, from the pediatric point of view is genetics. So a lot of, there are a lot of cases uh, which can cause acute liver failure kind of presentation in children. Uh, so if you look at adults, OTC deficiency, very common cause, may present in adolescents, 20s, 30s, 40s, mostly seen in males would present early, females, the heterozygous females may present later. And most important groups are mitochondrial disorders, vesicular trafficking, these disorders, I'll come to that. And you have seen this case. We presented last month, we had a case, a five-year-old case who was indeterminate ALF. Three years later, when we did the exome, came out to be this syntaxin positive, that is HLH. So HLH, one of the markers of this disorders of immune regulation, can, can present as autoimmune AL, uh, indeterminate ALF. So very interesting concept is of recurrent ALFs. Very commonly, not commonly seen, but recent concept of recurrent ALFs means that the patient would have recurrent episodes of acute liver failure which resolves spontaneously or with some supportive management. And the most important are disorders of this vesicular trafficking, energy metabolism, protein translation defects and uh, ammonia detoxification, OTC. I'm not going into the last part but I'll discuss briefly the first three. So what are dis disorders of vesicular trafficking? Vesicular trafficking nothing means this is the endoplasmic reticulum, this is the Golgi. You have a lot of transport which is going on, the endoplasmic reticulum produces proteins, pushes it towards the Golgi body, towards the anti-grade and there is a retrograde transport. And there are three main enzymes, which, uh, genetic genes which are there. One is this NBAS, RINT1 and this ZW10 protein, they form a NRZ protein complex which helps in this anti-grade and retrograde transport and SCY1 is a third gene which helps in the retrograde transport from Golgi body back to the endoplasmic reticulum. So what they have shown that predominantly uh, you may have recurrent acute liver failure in these three genes, uh, NBAS, RINT1 and SCYL1 and most of the triggers are predominantly they are triggered by fever. I'll show what fever does to them. And But predominantly they may have, you if, if you can go back in retrospect, you may have patients who have multi-system involvement in form of neurological and skeletal involvements. So predominantly majority of cases will present with recurrent liver crisis. They would have recurrent episode, one, two, three, four, five, you name them. I, I, one patient had almost eight acute liver failure kind of crisis which responds spontaneously. But majority of them would have this other involvement if you can, if you're careful enough to pick it up. And majority of these acute liver failure cases would happen in the early five, first five years of age and then the incidence goes down. 
So if you have if you have diagnosed, you won't be able to diagnose it in the first index presentation. But in the second and third episode, if you have done an exome, you find these genes. Don't push them towards liver transplantation. The majority of them will recover with conservative management without need for a liver transplantation, and the incidence will go down as they grow older. And this is what is important. That what fever does is in these patients, if you see uh, the as they have this is in vitro analysis in which they have shown that as you increase the temperature look at the nvas it is at 37 degree and at 37 degree there is a good protein uh, expression but as it goes down the temperature goes up this gene expression protein expression comes down second important is this uh, protein translational defect what are, what is translational basically means that you have a trna this amino acid binds to this trna along with this trna synthetase but if you have this mutated trna synthetase this trna is not bound this amino acylation is not there so you have hampered growing protein chain and which can cause a multi organ phenotype and these are the three more, most important genes lars1 iars1 and mars1 and you have recurrent crisis you have trigger fever with infection they will have alf they will recover again have trigger again have crisis again recover so they will keep on recovering and similarly with the nbas1 majority will have some multi system involvement and similarly to uh, the nbas1 you see that they are temperature sensitive if the fever goes up their expression goes down and they will land into liver failure third important one is uh, trmu deficiency this is a energy defect and it is known as transient infant infantile liver failure that sorry, means Vikram. the liver failure will happen sorry vikrant yes. what is the sorry to interrupt what yes. is the liver biopsy in nbas sir uh, mostly will show steatosis liver biopsy liver biopsy na? yes sir does it have necrosis or no necrosis? mostly it is steatosis minimal inflammation and some necrosis not steatosis is the predominant finding sir so why is the liver failure sir uh, because liver failure i'll 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 come to that okay. diagram i'll come to the diagram sir so third important is the transient infantile liver failure the term is clear it is a transient liver failure which happens in infancy and they will recover they will come out of this liver failure so if you see the density of alf episodes there is no episode after 10 month of life B majority of them look at the number of episodes majority will have one episode but some patients may even have five alf episodes in their natural history may have some but uh, multi system involvement predominantly some delay some hypotonia so what do you do with these genetics so people have tried uh, i'll show two large study this was a recent study that was brought from the european alf network so what they did they uh, looked at their 260 indeterminate alf and they based on their recorded samples this was all retro done in ret uh, retrospect that patients have already landed up with you they have developed acute liver failure and in retrospect you collected their samples and did whole exome sequencing in them so what you could find that almost whole exome sequencing gave you a yield of 37% so almost 1/4 one 1/3 of your patients could have a diagnosis which you are had pushed them into a waste basket of indeterminate liver failure and you can see the age of onset majority were these i'll show this diagram later also majority were early onset mitochondrial vesicular trafficking or this amino acylation defects and one important thing was that in this acute liver failure versus this re recurrent acute liver failure the hdlt levels were very very compared to this routine diagnosed cases of alf were higher so just this is the summary that everything boils down to your mitochondria most important this the mitochondria if you have the the, the ones they have highlighted one is the one the, they could find uh, mutations or variations in these predominant factors so this is the entire mitochondria and second one is the endoplasmic reticulum and the golgi body uh, complex in which you have vesicular trafficking and amino acylation defects that i have mentioned so these are the three major groups mitochondrial and the vesicular trafficking and the protein acylation defects which can cause recurrent acute liver failure I, i'll i'll show i'll come to that diagram actually i'm just waiting so one of the studies this was again from a uh, 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 uk group in which they had they did the same thing uh, they did in almost 20 patients and 12 of these patients came out with these whole exome sequencing and you can see these are the most commonly the same variation same genes that we were discussing previously so what but can you do genetics in alf normal turnaround time for a whole exome sequencing is on an average 3 to 6 weeks but recent studies have come up that 
you can do a ultra rapid whole exome sequencing and most likely this, this will come back to India also in next few years in which the fastest run time in critical case settings was 7 hours. So if you have a patient right now, if you can do it, it is possible and there are now multiple series published on ultra rapid whole exome sequencing. It is still costlier but maybe next few years it will come to India also. So what do you do with this diagnosis? Peep studies have shown, this was a recent study that was published from Japan, they have shown that they had a patient who had developed acute liver failure, they did not make a diagnosis, second time he again landed with acute liver failure, they did a whole exome sequencing, came, found it to be an NBAS mutation. So what they did, they, th they thought that it is a fever or infection triggered uh, infection. So what they did, and he subsequently developed three more acute liver failures after this diagnosis, but they could recover, they started giving them aggressive antipyretics. They did not let the fever come go up. And what they could make out that despite these three, they were conservatively managed and all these acute liver failure, he did not require a liver transplant. And the same thing happened in his sibling also. So what is the exact antipyretic you should use? It's still not clear. Avoid ibuprofen, they say. Uh, you should ideally avoid paracetamol because it also leads to endoplasmic reticulum stress but there is nothing else you can do so they in, uh, use IV paracetamol and glucose plus liquid you give them glucose infusion high glucose infusion rates you use early NAC I will show what, what NAC does you trig avoid triggers how do you avoid triggers you cannot avoid triggers in them Pe children would have recurrent infections but they say you advise them good hygiene advise them yearly flu vaccine and in this amino translation uh, uh, this amino acylation defects you can give them amino acids but Transplant should be the last resort because they will come out of this uh, recurrent acute liver failure crisis uh, if given a good opportunity. So this is important which Sir was asking. So if you have these defects, these are, this is endoplasmic reticulum and these are uh, your mitochondria. So if you have this NBAS mutation, this is PERK is one of the uh, proteins which are used by endoplasmic reticulum when you have stress response in which they are trying to build up an unfolded protein response. So what happens is, if you have these uh, variations in these genes, this is endoplasmic reticulum, this is mitochondria, when they develop fever, fever, would, fever is known as a physiological stress. So in these cases, this endoplasmic stress increases. Endoplasmic stress increases means, in, uh, this is a concept known as integrated stress response, unfolded protein response, in which ER stress increases and it will try to balance, it will try to create a physiological balance. But second, simultaneously, this mitochondria will break down in these variations, they will receive, uh, release this reactive oxygen species and this is here where role of NAS style cysteine comes up. What ER stress does, that it phosphorylates this AIF 2A, uh, using this PRK and HRI proteins and which will stimulate the release of CHOP and ATF4, these are the transcription factors which can either go into regeneration or apoptosis and necrosis based on how severe your variation is. And this uh, uh, reactive oxygen species may lead to increased apoptosis by induction of ASK1 and JA. So it is just a balance between what mitochondria or ER are able to handle this stress or not. Second thing, uh, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, cysteine is one of the, uh, I would say a cofactor for this TRMUG protein. So if you give this N-acetylcysteine or cysteine per se, you can see that overall there, there is a survival benefit in these patients, but not later liver survival benefit. But some studies have shown that you should use these NAC early in these cases. And this amino acylation defects, if you give them this leucine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, so what they have shown that there, when you give isoleucine protein fortification or you give leucine, they will have good amount of growth and they may recover early. But these are not, these are just supportive treatment that you can give in these patients. So based on this literature what I have shown, so people have done, this was a, uh, what they have, they have learned over the years how to manage viruses, how to look for autoantibodies, uh, drugs or these genetics. So what they have done, this was a study that was from PALS study group, what they did was based on their learning, based on their previous experience of last 10, 20 years on genetics and everything, they did a study in which, uh, so this was a study, three study phases from 1999 to 2004, first from 1999 to 2005, 2005 to 2009, 9 to 14. So after 
the 2009, they decided that let us make age-based diagnostic algorithm. Not algorithm, they will list of uh, tests you should do based on their age. So what they did was that uh, based on their age, uh, look at the indeterminate ALF. 90, so this was age-based diagnosis, I'll show this later, yeah. So what happened is that once they used this age-based uh, test, testing, they could decrease the incidence of indeterminate ALF from 48% to 31%. So indeterminate ALF went down, viral and paracetamol cases went up. So this is, this is not very clear, but you can see that they had divided the age-based testing less than three months, three months to three years, three months to 18 years, and four to 18 years. So people, should, people knew that if a patient is two year old, we will send, have to send these tests. And what they could make out that more than, say, more than three months of age, incidence increase for autoimmune, enteroviruses, drug-induced, HSP, ferritin, and MLDs. And they could de demonstrate that their liver transplantation rates decrease over these years when they use this age-based technology. And this is not all. This is now this is adult data. So what they did in this is ALF study group. What they did, they uh, retrospectively, what they went, they looked at their indeterminate cohort, and they did after expert review and additional testing, they could decrease their incidence of indeterminate acute liver failure from 11% to 5.5%. Added, they added unrecognized cases of paracetamol, autoimmune, daily, and viral agents. Now, this is the last part. Now, if you are not able to make a diagnosis, let me call them true indeterminate ALFs. So, you have done everything you could. You have looked at viruses, looked at autoimmune, looked at genetics. You still cannot find. And this may still be almost one fourth of your cases. What do you do in these cases? So, you have to look at the pathophysiology behind indeterminate ALF to do something about them. So we all know uh, this has been uh, known since 1980s and 90s that ALF is associated with inflammation. There is a lot of cytokine cascade which is going on. You see in TNF alpha and interleukin 6 compared to survival versus patients who have died. SERS component, SERS is pretty high in these patients. As the SERS component increases, whether it, it, they are infected or they are non-infected, their survival component, their survival probability goes down. And this has been shown in multiple series. So you have SIRS, which may or may not be uh, caused by infection, causes this cytokine casket, which leads to multi-organ dysfunction and encephalopathy. And this has been shown. It can, it can lead to increased severity of hepatic encephalopathy, survival benefit goes down, and even the, all the components that lactate also correlates with this thing. So what do you do? You know there is Im immune activation in these acute liver failure cases both adult and pediatric. So this was the fir uh, first study, not, I, was, I should not say the first study, first proper study, systematic study published 10 years back in which they looked, took uh, 77 ALF patients and they looked at their T-cell immune activation profile. Uh, they looked at inter uh, soluble IL-2 receptor, perforins, NK cells, cytolytic function and granzyme perforin. We all know, very well know these things. So what they could find that in patients who died, the IL-2 receptor alpha levels were comparatively higher compared to those patients who survived. And majority of the patients who had very high IL-2 receptor alpha, almost three-fourths of these patients were indeterminate ALFs. And studies have been done. Uh, I still do not understand the uh, statistics, this known as dynamic Bayesian network, dynamic network analysis, in which they show, they look at multiple inflammatory mediators at the same time, and they show that Compared to uh, survivors, patients who undergo, uh, who die or undergo liver transplantation have a very complex interaction between these mediators. And the main mediator, what they could find is HMG GB1, uh, high molecular waste box 1 protein, along with this MIG IP10. And we look at this diagram, uh, survivors and non-survivors. You see there is lot, something, lot of circles there, lot of cytokines going on. So they cannot still pinpoint that what can, what can you do about it, Grant but they can show. Conclude now. Oh, yes, yes. I know you are very excited. I'll skip through this. So studies have shown that there is a lot of inflammation. They can show that uh, n acetylcysteine can bring down this inflammation in these cases. And yes. So second thing, they correlated this with uh, liver biopsy also. They showed that if you have uh, this higher CD8 levels shows CD8 T lymphocytes, higher perforin, higher CD103 shows the memory T phenotype. 
it can correlate with your indeterminate ALF. So any etiology, say viruses, drugs and toxin, they can lead to the initial injury, cause this apoptosis and necrosis leads to this PAMs and DAMs, may cause hepatocyte damage, will release this cytokine cascade, which will cause this endotoxemia and sepsis. Based on this, if you can, if there is a spontaneous hepatic generalization, patients will recover. But if there is a persistent injury, if you are not able to manage this cytokine cascade or inflammation, it leads to death. And this concept also holds true for infective agents in which this may, this infective agents may just be a bystander, it may just unmask the underlying metabolic disorder and it may also correlate with poor out. If you can, there is a significant pro-inflammatory activity in these acute liver failure cases and if you can manage this increased pro-inflammation that happens in the early part before you let the CARS to go in, you can manage this inflammation, you can improve their survival in these patients. How do you improve their survival? People have used steroids, not good benefit, plus minus benefit. Uh, some studies have used non-steroidal regimens also including ATG, predominantly in patients who present with aplastic anemia. If you see, uh, they have started using ATG, WBC and counts improved, this ASTLT which were in thousands, liver failure improved. And so this is the trial which is going on uh, in PAL study group in which now they are using uh, double blind 3R mass CT, methyl prednisolone versus ATG versus supported treatment in indeterminate ALF. So you have steroid arm, ATG arm, placebo arm and they are, so this en en uh, enrollment has just started, uh, their target is 160 patients but is still in uh, early 20s, they still take 3-4 years to come and their outcome is survival at day 21. So this is my last slide, uh, so what can you do? Uh, so still what we do is, uh, you will start with hepatitis A, E and hepatitis B, that is your standard line. That is what we still do. But if you have some red flags, uh, we all know that Wilson's and autoimmune may have some underlying disorder. You will may go ahead with the common disorders like Wilson's, autoimmune drugs and do a metabolic screen, especially if it's a younger child. But if everything comes out to be normal, do think of these viruses. We had a couple of cases of adeno and HHP6 in children also. Think of HLH, think of other common disorders like uh, hyperammonemia or fatty acid oxidation effects or mitochondropathy based on the history. And if you have a recurrence or if you have an indeterminate ALF, you can think of whole exome sequencing if logistics allow. Thank you so much and apologies for extending the time. <laughs>